So as you know, we uh, a while ago reviewed a game called 1846, Race right. for the Midwest. Right, so that, it's an 18xx game. It's a real train game. When people say train game, that's the game they're talking about, right? They're games that, you know, often include things such as histor- real historical representations of actual trains. Yep. You got, like, operating There's, rounds right. and stock the rounds. The basic core idea of all these 18xx games, right? I think we reviewed 1846, which if you are going to get into these games, that is the first one to play. Yeah, do not start with this one. I don't even know no. if I want to recommend playing this one. No. Uh, we re- we reviewed it in late 2017. Now I've played a lot more of these games since 2017. Uh, and basically the core of these games is this really, it, they seem complicated and they are complicated for the average person, but that's because of reasons. But the core thing of all these games is that you invest in companies in one round. Then you the companies actually do business for two rounds, two identical rounds. And then you invest or divest in companies again, and you repeat this cycle of invest, com- work, work, invest, work, work. And whoever has the most shares in a company at a, during the work set turns is the person who actually controls that company during the work turn. It's like, you don't, the company isn't you, it's separate from you. Yep, you, you have your money, right, you, and you, inv- you run right, companies that you have a majority share right, in. Right, so to win, you want your money to be the most at the end of the game when the bank runs out of money, but... You know, so you sometimes you control a company, sometimes you might not control any companies. You might buy a company that used to be someone else's. You might sell a company now. You it's, might end up with three companies in front of you, and now your turn takes for fucking ever. Right. It's like you know the companies go in order, so it's like one company might go, then it's someone else's company, then it's your company. Right. That's how it works. It's yep. Investing, and then do, the companies do business, and then you investigate, and you're controlling basically your investment decisions. Which companies do I want to have shares in, along with trying to make certain companies do well and make some do worse. The ones that you have more shares in, you want to do better, so they spend out, spend out more money. And the ones you don't have shares in, you want them to do worse, so that other people will not make as much money. So when the game ends, you win. That's that's all there really is to it. Yep. Is and if you want to know more about, invest, you know. about like these details, like what these games are like on like this higher level, I will link to, go listen to our old review of 1846, because that's where we talk about a lot of this mm. in detail. Right, and that- We're going to review... This train game, in comparison to other train games, and in the context of, I was right. about to say normal, no, I was so just say regular board games. If you don't understand the other train games, you're not going to understand this review really well because the way you can't, say, it's hard to talk about it and except using words that only people who understand these games will understand. And the other thing I would say is that this game, this, 2038 Tycoons of the Asteroid Belt, if you have never played one of these train games before and you like the kinds of board games you see in a game like PAX, I doubt you will enjoy playing this game. Right. This game is it's, not easy to play. Right. There is no reason for me to try to explain this game in simpler you know, terms to someone who doesn't know anything about these games because this shouldn't be your first one. And if it, you, right? It, and it's the, the reason only reason that, to listen to this review is if you already know about train games, 18xx games, and you want to know about this one. But the reason for that, because I like, what, 1899, 1889? 1889. 1889 is the Japanese That's one? That's my favorite one so far. 1846 is my, like, second or third. I like right. 1846. But, anyway. but uh, the, thing, the thing I'll say about these games that's relevant here is that they all have this fundamental problem of, I don't want to say naive game design. It's not that problem. But they are designed for goals other than elegance and consistency of their mechanic, mechanics. Correct. They are designed for the historical experience. People The people who play them tend to like very fiddly rules yep. that have, like, there will be more exceptions to a rule than the rule. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you cannot internalize all the rules to one of these games unless you play them a lot. And right. if you play them a lot, they actually break down pretty poorly. Mm-hmm. So the problem with these games for someone who likes to play normal board games is that you can't just learn the mechanics and then start to play. You need to be constantly figuring out all the exceptions and fucking with the rules. And unless you have a facilitator, basically these games always need a game master or an expert to help you play them. Or a computer. Yeah, we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. Then they're very difficult to play. But that said... I love the shit out of 1846 right, and well, 1889. Saying, like I said, that core concept of investing in companies, controlling some of them, right, and trying to make the most money is a great game. And I still think... You could even replace... You could, And the best part is that simple framework can be expanded, contracted, and rearranged 
to make lots and lots of different games. You could make the investment part simpler or more complex or even crazy complex. You can make the operating part a completely different game. There's a game called a sh- sh- Big City Shoulders or something like that. Well, I forget the exact name of the game. If you go to Board Game Geek and type in Shoulders, there aren't that many fucking games with the name sh- t- word Shoulders in the title. Yeah. You're going to find it. I think it might be City of the Big Shoulders. Anyway, it's an 18xx game with an investment round and operating round. Save rounds. the big shoulders. I got it right. But basically, instead of trains, it's like a Euro game in the operating part. It's like you invest, and then you play a Euro game, and then you invest. It's the same, right? You or can- then there's games like Chicago Express. Take the core concepts of a train game and just like distill, distill, distill. Right, anyway. Or Paris Connection. So 2038, what it does is it gets rid of the historical part. By putting you way into a theoretical space future. We know we're probably not going to have space trains in 2038 at the rate things are going. But if we did... (laughs) Which already presents a problem from a game design perspective. Because the fiddly, like, fucky mechanics of the other historical train games at least are trying to model very real world history. Meaning, if if you know something about the 1840s in the Midwest, that historical knowledge will actually help you a little bit. be better. I'm not not a lot, but like a little bit. Like you can intuitively play the game by doing the things that make sense as an intelligent human being looking at a complex situation. Mm-hmm. And but in fact, if you do things that happened in history, right? Or they t- tend to play out the way they played out in history. Right, they tend to play out. So it's like, oh yeah, that that rail line was built there from the Civil War. But from then there this to event there. caused it to be irrelevant. Right, and then they had to dynamite it, and that happened around this year, and the game starts in this year, so if I do that at this timing, it'll pr- and it, it kind of yep. works out. So the games are almost more experiences. Like, if I play an 18xx game and I lose terribly, like go bankrupt or something, it's still really fun because it's almost like I'm playing this weird simulation. It's like playing a game just to see how the world I've ne- ends up. I've never won and I've never been upset playing an 18 x game. Yep. But <laughs> Any- with 2038, it has that same level of fiddly shit from a fictional inconsistent world. Right. And the thing is the fiddly shit is so fiddly that it becomes onerous. The operating round of this game where you run the trains, like my train goes here, here, and here to make this much money, is really fun and makes sense and I liked it, but as soon as it scales up even a little bit, it is it is a disastrous mechanic. Like right. it is it is unplayable. Right. So normally, the way it works in mo- right. most most of the eighteen XX games is when you actually run. Your, there's a point at which, after everyone's done building tracks and shit, we figure out how much each money each train spits out. And what you do is you look at the board and you say, "All right, my train has to start at one of my spots, right? And it gets blocked by other people's spots and." It can go on pretty much any track, right? My trains just can't... My my trains can't overlap each other, but I don't have to care about what anyone else's trains do. I just can't go through any spots they're blocking with their stations. Yep. Right? So it's pretty easy to look at a board, and it might not be easy to 100% perfectly get the best, pot, most money out of the trains. But you're close enough. But you can get very close. And once you get very close... It's like, well, what changed since last turn? Well, one piece of track was upgraded. Well, I guess my route is upgraded by $10 then. Right? I'll just run the same route again yep. with that one upgrade. And, and you don't it have tends to... to balance to where it takes it might take you a little while to figure out, but that is downtime for the other players to figure out some shit that they're gonna be doing. It right. It does, it's not too bad. It's it could be improved. A computer should just tell you the optimal routes and spit out the money with no thunking whatsoever. But it's not so bad that you're it's a problem that you're like frustrated with. Yep. In twenty thirty eight, the way it works is each train, each company operates in order. Ain't no tracks in space. Right. Going around with their spaceship, mining asteroids and collecting ore. And, but the problem- And delivering all that stuff and to another space it. station. Right. When and a, potentially refueling. Right. When a ship picks up ore, right, it picks up a little piece of cardboard off the board or flips it over- and now, no spaceship for the rest of the turn can get that ore. It's been that turn might involve like five different companies each running multiple spaceships. Right. So you, s- the first person, sends their spaceships out, and now you see which ores have been flipped over, a- and then the next person goes and sees which ores have been flipped over, and basically each person has to, for each spaceship. Every turn, completely rethink and refigure out the exact optimal way to get the most 
best oars, right, with each spaceship. No, even- And then you can't even begin to think about your spaceship until everyone before you has picked up resources with their spaceships. This, it, it made the game interminable. Now, on one hand... And the early turns is not a big deal, because it's like, okay, well, this one picks up the only two oars it can reach, and no one else can reach them. Fine. And there are also ways to stake claims on certain resources, and no one can take them, and hopefully you would claim the best ones, and that way you can quickly just be like, well, this ship takes all the claim spots. Yep. No thinking necessary, because no one else can take those. They're claimed. But you still get, when you get better ships, and more of them, and unclaimed spots or you ran out of claims you don't have enough claims those later turns in the game starting about halfway through become a big mess plus now, it gets part even- of that might have been that the way we were playing it because we weren't fully versed in like there's no history to look at yep so we ended up making companies in a way that was a little bit weird yeah like the way the board broke down totally legal though yeah but totally legal but it basically means that there is a trap where if the game evolves a certain way the game will take four times longer than it normally would Mm-hmm. But even if the game performed optimally, optimally, this operating around situation would still be a serious problem. Right. And even worse, unlike, say, Eclipse, which has a very elegant physical mechanism for representing complex resources, this game gives you fuck all for physical bits. You could solve this problem not the completely, computer. <laughs> but you could solve like a third of this problem just by having better physical components and ways to track this stuff better. Yep. The game doesn't give you anything to do this. Right. Another thing that have uh, another thing that contributes is also the lack of stability in the game. In a lot of other train games, there'll be a series of rounds where things pretty much stay mostly the same. Like the turn order of the company stays the same mostly. Yep. You know the. Ownership of the company stays the same mostly. Everyone just sort of operates and upgrades for a few turns, just moving things along. Here, it's like, all right, well, this turn, suddenly this company's value went way up, and now it's going earlier, so that changes everything, yep. right? Oh, and now these all these companies merged into the Asteroid League. Well, that fucking changes everything, uh, right? We'll get and to it, that. We'll get to that. Yeah, I want to talk about that because that part's really cool. I really those, like right, that those, part. That part is really cool. Yeah, there's right? basically, you know, in these train but, games... Well, we'll get I'm to just it. saying it contributes to the instability and in that you have to rethink the gathering of resource part every single time you're starting from scratch again, optimizing which or for each spaceship. And it, it's just this busy work. It's not even like decision making. I guess there's a little bit. You could theoretically take a suboptimal route with a ship to pick up resources to deny another ship resources. But how, not in a super significant way once the board is full of asteroids so everywhere. So to complicate this, there are ways to refuel ships so that, that they can move even further if they move a certain way, making it actually a pretty difficult problem to solve and optimize for. Like, mm-hmm. I even to give an unlimited time on a complex board, uh, it would take me a while to fully optimize. Yeah, I think it would actually be hard to write a computer program yeah. to fully optimize. And you like have the, options. The, of- the search graph would be enormous. And you'll have multiple kinds of ships. So when you're buying ships, you got to decide: Do I want the one that moves further and picks up less, or the ones that are like? There's way too many variables for the operating round, which should be the least interesting part of a train right, game. Right, it's not the part where you're making decisions, and I think that's a fundamental problem with all the train games is that the part of the investing part of the game, the stock round, is what actually most determines the victory condition, which player wins, which player loses, and which shares you have, right? The second part of the game, the operating rounds, are, are only sort of secondary to who wins and loses, right? They're important because they control how much money each company is spitting out, but if everyone's good, any, any good gamer can operate a company not optimally, but optimally enough that it's, you know, right? And the actual decisions made during the operating round aren't as crucial to the actual victory condition of the game, but they take a disproportionate amount of the time and effort, and the stock rounds are usually oversimplified and don't take long at all. So You're just buying and selling shares going in a circle. It's real simple. The really cool part about this game, which is why I really wanted to like it, mm-hmm. and this is why I, wa- I want to make a computer version of this game and then fix a bunch of stuff. But, uh, make 2048, 2058? In, the, in, the, in some of the other train games... The 2057, no, 58. <laughs> <laughs> different time, you understand. Different, the, uh, different spaceships. The independent companies tend to be pretty simple and disappear pretty quick. In this game, 
they're all way different. Yep. And you wrote them like real companies. The privates. And there's this whole complicated mechanic where, based on things I don't want to explain in too much depth, because you can learn this game if you want to play it, they can either join the Asteroid League or not join the Asteroid League at some point in the future. Yep. And the Asteroid League then becomes this company, and there's a whole like system around this that is really cool, and I really wanted to interact with that by playing the game more times until I ran into the operating round deadlock that made me never want to play this game again. Yep. I actually had the Asteroid League. I was the Asteroid League guy. I know. Which made it pretty cool because like, I started the game with one space company. If I would understood that I could withhold or pay out we, like I had the option with these in, these privates, I would have done something way different. Right. Because you can also take a private and like turn it into a company early. Like there's there's way more ways to form companies right. and do company stuff in this. Yeah, game. you could start. You can make a growth company, which is yeah. like a, a company that's worth like nothing at the start of the game. And basically, instead of joining Asteroid League, you'd start this little like I little startup. Who like ships like one good basically and sucks ass and starts with no share value. But I bought those shares for nothing. Right, but those shares were worth nothing because the company was like a guy with a like a tr space truck, is like Galaxy Trucker. But I didn't. Do and it. then theoretically, if you start one early enough and work on it and work on it, that can work out to end up being like a big ass awesome company. But and that's what I didn't understand. I kept paying out because I had a, I had Ice Finder, which was a really like it was making a shit ton of money for a private. Because the way I'd set it up. So I was making all this money, and I was paying out dividends to myself, and it was awesome. I didn't realize I could withhold even in these privates. I, if I'd known that, I would have withheld, and I would have gotten a couple of fewer shares of like the other companies. Weren't we just having a discussion about how it should be illegal to withhold, and companies should have to pay out dividends when their profits are too high? Oh, yeah, but <laughs> train games are about your evil capitalists exploiting saying. a corrupt system. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. No, I would do the completely unethical thing. Yeah. I would have withheld. I would have turned Ice Finder into, into a growth company, and I would have made bank. I right. would have played this game way differently. I had the Asteroid League, and it was way fun when the Asteroid League formed. And that was way fun. But the problem was, is now I had to control this giant-ass Asteroid League, and that kind of sucked. Oh, so, Chris in the chat says the Asteroid League Miners thing comes from a different 18xx game that's more normal. Okay. okay we got, I want to play that one, whichever one that is. Our friend Chris, you'll see him in the forum, and he, if you see a guy hanging out with us, like... Playing train games at PAXs, it's that guy. All right. Tr Chris brings us the train games. That's right. I don't own any of these fucking things. <laughs> I I would, well, I would consider owning 1846. I would make one before I bought one. I would own it to start ideating on how I would make one because this game taught me something I can just important. read a rules PDF if I need to. Yeah, I would play 1846, 1889, a lot of these other train games again. I would never play 2038 again. No, not, but, in, it, not in its default Tabletop form. But a video game that was designed to f feel a lot like this tabletop game, but take advantage of the fact that it's a computer and have a little more complexity. Like, these games would be more fun if you could have a little bit more complex stock market. Yeah. Like, if I, I could sell options from a train company to other players, or if a player sell futures, that would be fucking impossible to do elegantly on, in the tabletop. And if you made it too complicated, it would just turn into Civ or... Right. I mean, there is a New York one, I think, that has uh, a... Sell selling short and yeah. the stock market is a little bit more complicated but yeah like i said before the victory condition of all these games is mostly in the stock round the operating round is like this separate mini game of optimization i would really like to play one where the stock round was more advanced and had more decisions and was more complex and the operating round was simplified and made more elegant and streamlined and abstract uh and this while the theme and some of the detailed rules and cool thematic things like the asteroid league and the mining uh the, at least the 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 theme of the mining make it awesome the reality is this is the exact opposite of what i want in a train game it is the a much simpler stock market or at least a normal level of complexity stock market for these games and a ridiculously tedious operating rounds that are have fun aspects but just too many busy work aspects that yep. take too goddamn long but here's the line. to make it worth my while. And so it's With 1846 like... With 1846 and 1889, it's like I'll still play those games because it's worth my while enough. Yes, the tedium is not insane. 2038 is impossibly tedious in the operating round. Yep. yep. All right, so 
If you want to play and get into these games, you can go listen to our old episode of 1846 or yep. go play 1846. Or 1880 or 1889. Mm, yeah, like, you can play that one too, sure. But do not play this one. 1889 is actually better in a lot of ways. In some ways. Do not play this one, 2038, as your first one. If you're super experienced with these games and you don't mind some tedium and you just want to see what the deal is, there's a lot to, there's some good stuff to see here in this one. So I'd recommend like you play yep. it, learn it. Maybe not play a whole game of it because it would take too long, or maybe you just have a ton of time. And thing is, even though like our, this but, game, our game went on so long, we got kicked out of packs and couldn't finish it. Right, I would but, not recommend this one though for serious buying, playing, and replaying. Yep, but I realized something fundamental: the the primary problem with these games is that because they are tabletop and because they have very fiddly rules everywhere else, they end up needing to rely heavily on start player order. And the mechanics to determine that are just terrible. Mm -hmm. And it matters too much to be a terrible mechanic. Yep. That is the thing I think you could solve with all of these tabletop games. You can make them more elegant without, without ruining what makes them unique and different from the Euros we tend to like more. Yes, I'm in favor of a simultaneous market and not an ordered market because... I learned after playing, it took me like a year or two. Oh, Scott, mule, 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 mule. Right. It took me a year or two to learn how important the priority deal is because that means you go first in the stock round, how that gives you oh. the, con basically, had, you know, having it at the right time is how you win the game. And I've played several games of this and I basically got burned by it over and over. That I learned oh. it, but got burned by it even though I saw it and was trying to grab it. In this it. one, I was the start play. I basically had the start for most of the game right. because it was a three-player game and neither of you were willing to like rust stuff and I just, I just like I well no uh, there was a game of 1889 I played I think at MAGFest where I finally understood it and was trying to gra grab a hold of it and right it's like I understand it now yep. but I can't I can't get it. Yeah, you know what that's like? It's like, ooh, I understand this Raging Bull. Now but, I will attempt to ride it. Right, it's like I understand <laughs> what I have to do in a video game, but I, even though I know when to, I have to push the button at that time, but I keep pushing it and it's not the right time and I keep dying anyway. Yep. When we played this, it was the first time where I finally managed to grab a hold of that priority mm -hmm. deal mechanic at the right time, move my trains from one company to the other, force the shitty company onto rim, yep. right? get everything in order. I didn't do it perfectly. I could have done it even better, but that's just because I didn't understand exactly when the trains would rust, the uh, spaceships would rust. But the problem is so the I spaceship could have, rusting I, is also so important and also relies so I heavily could have, on the turn order. Right, but I could have screwed rim more, but the point is that was the first it you know it, it would regardless of which one he played this still would have been the one where i figured it out finally yep. um because it's the same mechanic in all of them basically so coincidence there so yeah space trains is the only one i've played so far that i would never play again mm -hmm. which is a shame because stylistically a plus stylistically a plus a plus it feels very doomed all the adjacent. characters and art and uh, you know everything about space wise is really great so that's a shame This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to...